Okay, last session of the day. Thank you for making it thus far. Uh, for those of you who were, who was here at my session before the, the break, so some of you are familiar. So what we did was, well, the background of these, this talk was I was asked if I would do the same talk twice. I said, nah, that's boring. I'll do a different talk on the same subject, but we'd, I won't decide, or I'll let, we'll decide by chance what the order is of the talk. So we flipped a coin at the beginning of the last one, and it happened that the second talk, which is called All Work and No Play, was the one that I did. So I'm doing this one now, and I'll explain the redux part of it uh, in a second. Although those of you who are at the plenary this morning, the first plenary, Sarah Priestley, who was there? Right now, wow, you've been here all day. Um, <laughs> Well, 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 she did it much better in 10 minutes than I can in half an hour, but well, that's, the, that's what happens when you have a conference theme. Everybody's talking to it, and of course there's a lot of repetition and overlap, so I will be referencing Sarah's talk uh, from time to time. So, um, let's see if this is working. So it's... Um, I think in the uh, abstract I said something about, yes, this notion of learning a language without tears is a very old one, French without tears, and it's the name of, you find it in a number of uh, different versions and old course books. So this is a, a, a book I found in Portugal, published in Lisbon in the, in the 30s or 40s, called English Made Funny. Um, uh, here's another one, yes, the notion of English, but this is the Astamil, fav famous Astamil courses from which the line, my tailor is rich, uh, is, derives in the very first unit. And of course, that's English without effort. And there's another one, Laugh and Be Merry. This was a, a Langenscheidt course published in Germany. Uh, and I think about 1939, not a time to be merry in Germany. But anyway, <laughs> maybe that was the antidote. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, but this is very much a theme that runs through a lot of the literature on language learning that uh, it should be lighthearted and fun. And... I'm not, oh, there's another one. This I quite like this because it combines the two, toil and chat in English. Uh, this is a, a course I found in Argentina. Um, I apologize, by the way, it's not your eyesight, it's the projector that's making things look f fuzzy if you think it's because you've been here too long. Um, and if you look at, if you Google, well, not Google, if you go into a corpus and look at the adjectives that most, or the nouns that most commonly collocate with fun, you'll see that fun activities, and this is in the enormous corpus of contemporary American English, I think, I'm not sure, it might be the British National Corpus, but it's on that site. Uh, and fun activities uh, features as a very common collocation of fun. And of course, often it's in the context of education. And so here are some examples, uh, all from mainstream education. I'm not gonna read them to you, but can you see that, uh, that it's a common meme, if you like, running through the discourse of education, which was a point that Sarah made this morning, and it's not just in general education, but also in our own field, and this is the British Council Teaching English course, and if you just Google or search for fun in that, as Sarah said this morning, you'll find lots and lots of fun activities, fun with dialogues, fun with testing, fun with um, everything, you name it. Uh, and and at the, uh, interestingly enough, I did a search of the IATEFL uh, program last month's conference in Brighton, and sure enough, there were these fun listening activities, vocabulary review in fun ways, English fun again, having fun. Uh, I, who said IELTS lessons can't be fun? And so on and so on and so on. So this was just from that relatively small corpus of talks at the IATEFL conference. Now, this has always been a, uh, as it was, as, there's another one, as there's another one, it doesn't stop. Um, oh, there's another one, oh my God. Um, it's, uh, as Sarah was saying this morning, it's, it, it sort of, it worries me a little bit, this emphasis on happy, clappy uh, language teaching activities, if that was, if fun was the bottom line, that's all you needed for an activity to be successful, it is fun. And it's, an, it's, a, it's a view that's been critiqued uh, consistently throughout, for some considerable time, not, well, there's another one, uh, not least by this man, Neil Postman, who was one of the, 
uh, more, well, savage often, uh, but consistently critical um, spokesperson for a view of education which was not dominated by fun nor by technolo technology which makes things fun. And his particular beef and when he was writing mainly in the 80s and 90s of the last century was uh, on television and the way television was uh, being used for educational purposes. And he wrote this book called Amusing Ourselves to Death and basically it's not just about education, it's about television generally and the way that it kind of dumbs down culture. But particularly uh, he saw it as being a pernicious influence in, uh, in education uh, in its avatar as things like Sesame Street, for example. And he felt that this idea that you've got to turn everything into fun was counterproductive, essentially. It's not what education is about. And he said, uh, if you look at the history of the philosophy of education, um, he says, well, television's principal contribution is the idea that teaching and entertainment are inseparable. He said, this entirely original conception is to be found nowhere in educational discourses from Confucius to Plato to Cicero to Locke to John Dewey for the idea that education and entertainment are somehow mutually implicated. So he said, well, this is, you look in all the ed educational literature, the philosophy is, this, nobody's ever said that. Uh, and it was a bit like Sarah was saying this morning, none of her students have ever asked her for more fun. Now, um, this, uh, this view has been around for some considerable time. I said Postman was writing in the 1990s, and he's since updated, and that's a new edition of his book. I mean, he's no longer with us, unfortunately, but he also took on technology and computers, etc., at an early stage when he saw this also as being rather invasive and, and disguising the fact that it, education is not about getting information. It's doing things with information. Computers are good at getting information, but they're not necessarily good at doing things. So that was another one of his critiques. But I'm not going to go that long. I want to just go back a bit. When I was a teacher trainer uh, in, in the 90s, uh, working on in-service courses particularly, um, and so, some of you, in fact, experienced those in-service courses with me, uh, one of the things that me and Neil Forrest, my colleague on the diploma, then called D-Tefla course, found uh, to our frustration was that the lessons we were observing seemed to be terribly activity-based. There was lots going on, but it, was at the, it seemed to be at a minimal level of engagement, a minimal level of engagement. It was like, I use the, uh, the metaphor of a, a car engine idling. You can hear the noise, you know, lights on, but no one at home. <laughs> it's idling, it's not going anywhere. And I, this concerned us because we felt that, um, that, well, you know, the teachers were going a little bit too soft on, on the learners. And, I, and I, we were interested in thinking of why, why might this be the case? Uh, and so in the run about this period, I put together a talk called No Pain, No Gain. And this is why this is the redux version, as I revisit it after so many years. And I can prove that, but I managed to retrieve this from my computer, my hard disk, uh, from dated 1992. This was the kind of overhead transparency. Remember those? They were also pretty fuzzy. Um, and this was the map of the talk. So I'm not, I'm not going to do the talk again because I don't have time. I'm going to pick out a couple of things from it and just remind you that this was 1992. Has anybody heard of Demand High? Yeah, well, I mean, I, this is 1992, and I was talking about that. So, um, so, <laughs> uh, so these are some of the reasons I felt that... that, that that teachers have gone a little bit soft and had perhaps were prioritizing activity and fun activities at the expense of actual learning activities. Uh, and one of them, I have to say sadly, was the communicative approach. The communicative approach, whatever, however we visualize it or construe it, uh, did initially at least adopt a very non-interference, non-intervention view of language learning. Get the learners doing tasks and learning will take care of itself. And I've quoted this by Dick Allwright, I don't know how many times, I ought to know it off by heart, but it's, uh, it seems to be catch the essence of the early days of the communicative approach. If the language teacher's management activities are directed exclusively to involving learners and solving communication problems in the tackle language, then language learning will take care of itself. Magic. Have them doing uh, design and 
I mean, describe and draw activities. You have them manipulating Cuisinier rods behind a screen, making shapes and then describing it to them, etc. Uh, and the teacher can be fairly sure of not being guilty of un unwarranted interference. Unwarranted interference. And so that's fairly negative. So the idea that the teacher doing anything was unwarranted interference was sort of built into these early days. Prabhu, in his, um, uh, the famous Bangalore, uh, experiment, what's it called, uh, in uh, Bangalore, um, he said similar things. It's all about hands off. Uh, is the idea is that learners engage in an effort to cope with communication. Now there is, this is a key word here I think, effort, and the effort perhaps is what we weren't seeing in our classrooms here. So there was built into, as I said in the last talk, in the idea of tasks is, is, is working with language. Uh, and but what we were seeing was not, there wasn't, as I say, a, a great deal of work. And of course, this was particularly exacerbated by the uh, humanist philosophy that was very much the rage in the 1980s, 1990s, in which I was affected by, among others. And so you get um, Suggestopedia, which I talked about in the room, Suggestopedia, where the students are lulled into a state of almost hypnotic <laughs> suggestion where the, the teacher simply reads them things and they kind of, it's all done by osmosis. Um, and the students should enjoy, this was the philosophy behind it, the students should enjoy what they're doing and not see it as something hard. This implies an absence of any destructive or inhibiting tension. Take the tension out of the classroom and just have everybody almost comatose. And so you get, uh, of course, the idea that we talked about, those of you who here before, that the effective filter needs to be removed. And this is what's, this, according to this guy, Stephen Krashen, is what is uh, blocking learners from achieving this, the, this almost childlike state of language acquisition of osmosis, as it were, where the comprehensive just shoots into this little black box and it comes shooting out as output and just got to take this thing away. So give students anything, uh, including soft music and comfy furniture. And here's a picture that I, from Google Images, of a suggestopedia class and you can see the students on bean bags. Uh, and here, I think this is where they're actually... <laughs> <laughs> So this is, this, is, this, is where, this is where humanism was taking us, into class walls of dozing students. So this is, where, where, this is where I, what I was critiquing at the time in the mid-1990s. Like, this is like a one-way street. This is not exactly what language learning should be about. Uh, but it's continued. And, uh, and, the, th and the most, one of the most vocal spokesmen of this view that there should be no intervention in language learning is, and this is, he's much more recent, is this man, Sugata Mitra. Now you know Sugata Mitra because of the hole in the wall project where he put these computers in various walls and Indian villages and children kind of magically taught themselves how to, uh, you know, make, I don't know, nuclear bombs or whatever, but they did it with no training, using, the soft, using their common sense and doing it um, Co collaboratively. And so he, uh, Sugata Mitra, proposed this idea of minimally invasive education by analogy with minimally invasive surgery, you know, when you go in the knee just through a tiny little etc. Uh, so he says it's a, it's a pedagogic method that uses the learning environment to generate an adequate level of motivation, an adequate level of motivation to induce learning in groups of children with minimal, minimal or no intervention by teacher. And this is why he's particularly controversial, because his, um, the implication of this is because the teachers just get in the way. But when he gave a talk at IATEFO a few years ago to a, a thousand teachers in the room, can you imagine how well that went down? <laughs> I, 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 I'm not knocking him 100%, you know, completely, because I think there is, an S, there is a grain of... I think he does tap into a natural a capacity that children have, the curiosity, and also the collaborative learning. And if they've given enough t incentive, then of course they can learn all sorts of amazing things. So we do need to kind of adopt a bit of a hands-off approach. But I'm not saying that necessarily translates into a classroom of adult learners who are in a hurry. So, so this is where it's, we seem to be going. Um, and what I'm arguing, therefore, is that um, 
fun is counterproductive if fun and we're taking fun in the sense of just uh, entertainment uh, because it doesn't necessarily equate with attention and nor oddly enough and this is surprises some people perhaps it doesn't equate necessarily of motivation and I think this has already been said today I've seen the title of a number of talks one about challenge the new fun challenge is the new fun is that so is that, that was, uh, and so I'm repeating what's already been said. I just want to look at this thing of attention. Um, it's a kind of given, I think, that you can't learn anything very well unless you're paying attention. The idea that you can learn a language in, a, in your sleep, I mean, it was promoted. You know, there was, people would sell <laughs> cassettes and you'd put them on a, at night and you would listen to Swahili all night and you'd wake up. <laughs> you'd wake up. <laughs> what was that about? Um, <laughs> so uh, attention is like the bottom line, it seems, in, in learning and in language learning. What is attended is learned. This is the cognitive view, at least. What is attended is learned. You need to pay attention. Uh, and there can be no acquisition without it. Now, there, there is still dispute about this, and it depends what you mean by attention. Attention can cover all sorts of kind of uh, kinds of cognitive awareness from just being vaguely dimly aware that something's going on and, 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 and to a state of complete uh, what they call cognitive arousal. So it could, it does mean a lot of different things. Uh, there is some suggestion of course that we do learn stuff incidentally. We learn vocabulary incidentally through reading. We're not actually paying a lot of attention to it. So it, you can, but you've got to read massively to get that kind of incidental vocabulary. Two million words perhaps a year or more um, to show any kind of results. You, but all the people writing about vocabulary say it's much better if, if, this, if the, you're much quicker if some attention is given to the words that they're written down, that you look them up in a dictionary, that you go back and review them, all that kind of thing. Um, now, the idea, I don't know why, yes, uh, that's right, so various people have been talking, I mean one of the phenomena of the modern age is this, this thing of multitasking, uh, of di dis dis dispersed attention, and this uh, woman, Laura S Linda Stone, who I can't remember, but she worked in some, one of the big companies like Google or it wasn't Google or something like that but she knew she was working in that kind of Silicon Valley environment and she said looking around and she said this is the condition of the age what she called um, continuous partial attention we're constantly being distracted by our devices by other people's devices by messages coming all over the place and we're kind of and and part of this distraction is motivated by the fear of missing out now, this is why people are constantly checking their uh, phones. Uh, it is an always on, anywhere, anytime, any place behavior that involves an artificial sense of constant crisis. I might be missing out. Somebody might have just sent me a WhatsApp. Uh, so this is very, very counterproductive in terms of focusing your attention, because the attention is dispersed. I mean, she herself doesn't say it's necessarily a bad thing all the time, but it's probably not a good thing to be happening in a classroom. And in fact, the studies have shown that even the presence, even when you get everybody to turn their phones off, but the presence of the phone, the physical presence of it, makes people antsy. And so, you know, um, uh, and similarly, other things have been said about uh, the uh, wired students that, this argument that the educational potential of the internet is limitless is actually it's apparent that when you look at how students are using technology they're using it less to learn than to be distract themselves from learning so there is uh, clearly a danger and I'm not going to reiterate all the arguments but it's um I think it's the pro same problem though with activity in the classroom whether it's mediated by technology or not that sometimes the activity can become the focus and not the language that the activity involves. Yeah? So we're meant to be, you know, this is what the language classroom was about. These activities were designed to practice language, but the focus goes on to the activity at the expense of the language. This is one of the problems because of this dispersed attention. Um, 
so that was me. Uh, and so that's what I just want to, all I want to say about attention. How long have I got? Ten minutes, okay. So I want to talk about motivation now. And I want to reference, again, something that Nick referenced this morning in his plenary, which is the work of the Hungarian, dare I say it, his name again. We talked about it before. Not Donye, it's, uh, where's Paul? <laughs> There's my man, say it again, Paul. Exactly, so his theory of flow, flow, optimal experience, that it is a delicate balance between having, uh, being challenged but having the skills to meet the challenge. Now, I was talking about that, and this is, the, this is how you can visualize it. So, challenge is high, but if you've got the skills to meet the challenge, then you're somewhere up here. You're likely to experience this uh, flow experience, which is when you're completely absorbed in a task to the point that you forget, you know, time, you don't notice time passing if you're really good about it. Now, I was using this argument this morning, I mean, this morning before the break, to justify having fun or play or engagement in the classroom, but I think you'd equally argue that it's, uh, it supports the idea that to be truly motivated, it's not about having fun, it's about having a degree of challenge. And this is what, in fact, Nick was talking about this morning, being challenged, having a purpose, but also being challenged. So remember we did the activity dropping the pen, but when we were given, uh, we were challenged to do it uh, quicker, then we felt a greater degree of satisfaction. So it's that, that, as I say, the calibrating the degree of challenge of a task uh, with the skills that, the, in this case, our case, the learners have to match it. Uh, but the challenge to me seems to be the operative word here. And this is what I felt watching these classes, that they were, students were under-challenged. <coughs> and we were doing, working with the D. Tefler scheme, and had a checklist of things to look out for in the classroom, but there was no mention of the word challenge. So, you know, you could tick all the boxes and say this was the best, fabulous lesson because it ticked all the boxes, but I didn't feel the students learnt anything because they were being under-challenged. But there was nothing there that we could say. So, you know. <coughs> so, um, so this, is the, this is what generated my concern. And also because at the same time, people were coming through and saying, well, that crash in and all this effective filter and just listen to comprehensible input. Hmm, not so sure. If you're not producing anything, just hearing me, how many, you know, uh, you, can you learn a language watching television? Skills. You get good at listening, yeah. perhaps, yeah. But you don't become necessarily a better speaker. Because when you're listening or when you're reading, what are you doing? You're going from one lexical word to the other. You're not looking at the preposition, you're not looking at the articles, you're not looking at the auxiliaries. How many subjunctives have I seen in Spanish by reading the newspaper in 30 years? I must have been exposed to 10,000 subjunctives. Can I produce them? You must be joking. But I don't hear them. I don't see them. They just fly by. Venga, venga, venga. No, 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 no. I'm just, I'm following, I'm watching, I'm focusing on the content. When you have to produce, then you have to focus on the endings, the articles, the auxiliaries, and so on. You can't get away talking me, Tarzan, you, Jane, language forever. <laughs> Believe me, I've tried. But. <laughs> so, uh, so about the same time uh, as I was worrying about all this, then along comes uh, the Canadian uh, applied linguist Meryl Swain, and she proposes what she calls the, instead of the input, uh, plus one of comprehensible input, the crashes idea that you need input, which is just pitched a little bit above what you presently understand. You need to be producing output plus one. You need to be pushed. And that's the operative word there. The learner's output should be pushed towards the delivery of a message that is not only conveyed, it's not enough just to convey the message, but that it is conveyed precisely, coherently, and appropriately. So being and she says, being pushed in output is a concept that's parallel to that of input plus one of Krashen's input hypothesis. And I kind of thought, yeah, this is exactly, this seems to be the problem. Where is the push? Where is that little delicate, gentle push, the non-threatening push, but the push which is raising the bar in terms of the challenge, but providing at the same time the skills to meet the challenge? That, so uh, this is what uh, we, I wasn't seeing. And of course, it's, it's called other things by other writers. Michael Long, for example, calls it interlanguage stretching. Uh, we want learners to take every opportunity to deploy grammar in their talk, 
stretching their linguistic resources so that they use language which is grammatically rich. And I like this, it requires learners to operate at the outer limits of their current abilities, the outer limits, like in that, the zone of proximal development, if you like, to use another theory, theoretical model. So uh, it's, this is again what I wasn't, what we weren't seeing enough of, that learners being whoops, pushed to their, um, to their limits of their current competence. Now, uh, it's not easily done, as I was saying before, if you've got a class of mixed um, where was I saying that? I wasn't saying it before. Uh, <laughs> I was thinking it. Uh, you've got a class of mixed abilities. How do you push that student and not that one, etc.? But I think the key, one of the key ways of doing that is, is through task repetition. And finding ways to repeat tasks that don't feel like repetition. Because, I mean, nobody wants to repeat, repeat, repeat. But if you can devise a task and then change one element of it, so that it seems new, but it's actually the same task, then you are, there's a chance that you will be pushing learners, uh, particularly if you calibrate the task, you change the time, so you, know, you have to do it quicker. I'm going to give you, you've got four minutes to do that, I'm going to give you two minutes to do that little talk, that kind of thing. Um, or uh, where learners set their own targets, and they decide what they want to achieve. But I mean, one obvious way of getting, of, cha of changing an element in a repetition task is to change the audience. So instead of you two having just done your little describe and draw or whatever, or talked about the weekend, then you two do it, and you do it with Jessica and so on. So there's a constant change of audience, or the, the idea of the carousel, the gallery walk, or wh whatever you want to call it. So you've got everybody around the room, half the class around the room with a picture of their family tree, let's say, and the other half are going around asking them questions about it. So in, in the end, if there's 24 students in the class, they'll have, they will have talked about their family 12 times. And you can, you can make it go faster by t upping the, uh, the time thing, saying, okay, so first time around, three, four minutes, then we're going to increase, etc. So anything like that, or just simply getting learners to, to change the physical uh, way that they do something. So instead of talk, doing a dialogue and pairs sitting down, just stand up and do it. Stand up and do it in front of the class. Um, I'm going to video now, you now, etc. So each time you're upping the ante, you're, you're feeding in an extra element of challenge. So you are pushing the learners constantly to the limits of their competence. But it's safe. I mean, they've had a chance to rehearse and that's not like deep end approach. Uh, sometimes it's stressful, but then, you know, stress can be good. And there's two kinds of stress or two kinds of anxiety. The facilitating anxiety motivates the learner to fight the new learning task. Come on, I can do it, I can do it. It gears the learner emotionally to appro approve for approval behavior. Debilitating anxiety, on the ha other hand, motivates learners to flee the task. It's, stimulates the individual emotionally to adopt avoidance behavior. So we want to be up here facilitating stress, a little bit of facilitation, because after all, uh, language is maybe learned in situations which are stress-free, but it's certainly not used in situations which are always stress-free. And how many of you have been in the situation I've been in often and trying to suddenly get angry in Spanish and caught in English because they shortchanged <coughs> me? And I, was never, I never had any practice at doing that in the classroom. So. It's like, well, can I tell that joke again? I told it last weekend in Brussels and people laughed. It's about the story about the, it's like the story about the man, the, f the French film director who went to, he won a prize, a film prize, an Oscar or something. And so he, um, he turns, didn't speak a word of English, but he's going to go to this, this, the prize giving ceremony anyway. But so his friends are just saying, look, all you have to do is say thank you. He goes, thank you. No, 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 thank you, thank you, practice, thank you, thank you, thank you. They give him a mirror, <laughs> thank you, thank you. He's practicing, he's on the plane, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. And the taxi, do the thing, <laughs> thank you, thank you, gets up to the station, they give him the price, he says, merci beaucoup. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because he wasn't practicing in sufficiently psych psychologically authentic conditions, yeah, with the right amount of stress. So when he was in the stress, it all went out the window. We've all experienced that. So that was a joke, because the, theory, the theme is fun after all. I don't want to come across as cranky uh, like that, but um, I, I think you've now seen both sides of the picture, those of you who have seen both 
the arguments, or you can imagine what the other argument was. There's very good uh, arguments for fun, for play, for entertainment as well. So it's a question, I think, ultimately, like everything. That's it. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> it's hard. We're not going to have questions. We're going to have drinks instead. <laughs>